The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Thought provoking, informative, engaging. Are you ready to be inspired and equipped? And now, The Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. Welcome to the Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort. I am Mark Spence. Joined in the studio with us here today is Eddie Roman. The Comfort Zone, a program ignored and refused to be watched by billions and billions of people. That's now, you're not one of them. It's a lot of people. It is a That's lot of people. encouraging. But our friends are tuning in, both of them. And we thank you for tuning in. You know, we are actually here to inspire you, to equip you, to challenge you to share the gospel. And there's many different ways to share the gospel, whether that's on the college campuses, open air preaching, handing out gospel tracts. Maybe you put a track inside of your Christmas card at Christmas time. All different types of ways to share the gospel. But the gospel, Ray, does the gospel change? No, no, it remains the same. Christ died for our sins, rose again on the third day. All the gospel means is good news. Yep. And, and that really is the understatement of eternity, to say there's good news for humanity. When I want to present the gospel and I say good news, good news is when your chickens lay a dozen eggs a day. This yep. is everlasting right. life being offered to hell-bound, dying humanity. There couldn't be better news. And that's what the gospel means, good news. Yeah. Ray, you, you share a very interesting story in... Uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. It's episode 14 of season two of our TV show. I was wondering if you'd just take a moment and uh, share that. Yeah, you've been asked to uh, preach to a thousand people on the hundredth floor of the World Trade Center, and the date is September the 10th, 2001, the night before that terrible disaster in New York. So what are you gonna preach? You know these people are gonna fall to their deaths. They're gonna drop with the uh, building and their bodies will never be recovered. Uh, others will be burned alive by jet fuel. Others will jump a hundred stories to the unforgiving uh, sidewalks of New York. Horror beyond horror. So what are you going to say? God has a wonderful plan for your life, the modern message? You can't say that. If you knew these people were going to die, what you'd do is you'd say, you have to face God on judgment day when you pass through death. The Bible says it's appointed a man once to die and after this the judgment and God is holy and righteous. He sees lust as adultery, hatred as murder. Please consider these things before you pass through death. Listen to your conscience. Think of your past sins. Think of what's going to happen on judgment day. Every secret sin in the imagination of your heart is going to come out as evidence of your guilt. And you're going to end up in hell if God gets justice on that day. But God is rich in mercy and He provided a Savior who suffered and died on the cross for your sins, rose again on the third day and defeated death. And if you'll repent and trust in Him, God will grant you remission of sins, give you the gift of everlasting life. And you'd say, please think about this because you don't know when you're going to die. Yeah. That's what you'd say to people who are about to die. So why should we change the message yeah. for people who are on the street, people who are about to die? 150,000 people will die today. Some will die in horrific circumstances crushed in a car, burned alive in a car. Uh, others will die of terrible diseases like cancer. And you can't say to them, God has a wonderful plan for your life. You've got to tell them the truth that God is holy, He's appointed a day, He provided a save, and you must repent and trust in Him. So we have strayed from biblical evangelism horribly over the last 40, 50, 60 years and offered this wonderful plan that has no basis biblically. You say, but it is, it's a wonderful plan. Well, read Fox's Book of Martyrs for bed bedtime reading and see how the, the foundation of the church is soaked in blood. Uh, look at the promise of Scripture. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, you'll be hated for my name's sake. The time could come when people kill you thinking they're doing God a favor. We enter the kingdom of God through tribulation, temptation, and persecution. And they're the promises of, of Scripture, plus everlasting life, which is kind of tapped on the end, which makes all Amen. the trials and temptations and persecutions well worth it. So, I mean, if the wonderful plan for your life is not the biblical gospel, if we would have to change that, if we knew we were going to be preaching that message on the 100th floor of Tower One, uh, knowing that within 24 hours, these people were going to be jumping to their death on the unforgiving sidewalks of New York, right. things were going to happen that were going to be so unimaginable to the human body, then that can't be the biblical gospel. That's exactly what you just shared. Yes, if that right. is the message that we're sharing, 
then we need to change our message. But if we have to change our message, then it's not the biblical gospel. Uh, Ray, you touched upon it very beautifully there. Uh, Eddie, if that's not the biblical gospel, what is the biblical gospel? Well, when you say the biblical gospel, it just means what, is, what does the Bible have to say about right. it? And this is so important to know because there are so many different groups in the world today that claim to have the, the gospel, the good news, whether it be Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, so many different groups, um, they promote themselves as saying, we have the good news. That is, we have the way for you to get to heaven. So it's really important to understand what the Bible has to say about this. And the best place, the clearest place I can see to go to look at th just a clear definition of the Bible would be 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it, it begins, Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, and in also which... You stand. So right from the start, Paul's laying it out. He says, okay, this is the gospel. This is the gospel I preached. This is the gospel you received. This is the gospel in which you stand. So in other words, this is it. This is a definition of the gospel. In verse 3, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that's it. You know, the gospel is, is it's an event. It's something that happened. The fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. Our faith, the gospel isn't, isn't a philosophy. It's not 10 things you do in order to get right with God. The gospel is based on something that actually happened. All right? It's not a, a, a philosophy, a way of thinking. It's, we look back at what God did. He died on the cross. And when he did that, he took the punishment for our sin. That's, that's the big deal. That's yeah. why it's so important. You know, you say, what's, what's the big deal? This guy died on the cross and rose from the dead. Well, that's, you know, he gave us, what did he do? He gave us an example on how we're supposed to live. No, that's not it at all. The Bible says that because of our sin, we deserve to be punished. Now, a lot of times we don't, we think, well, you know, yeah, I've sinned, but I haven't done anything that bad. Well, when you think that way, it just shows that you don't understand how holy God is and how repulsive your sin is to this holy God. Because of our sin, we deserve to be punished. We deserve God's wrath. And the only thing that can save us from God's wrath is God. And the way he chose to save us is by, by taking the punishment on himself when he died on that cross. That's why the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is so important. That's why it's good news. The word gospel just means good news. And that's why it's good news, because it's good news for us. We don't have to be punished. We don't have to, to die and go to hell, which would, be, which would be a just punishment for our sin. But the good news is that God's provided a way for us to escape that punishment. That's why it's good news. Right. You know, exactly. Jesus never promised that if we accept this wonderful plan, that things are going to get easier for us. In fact, he said the opposite. Things will get much difficult. But Ray, let, let me for just a moment play the devil's advocate here. In John 10.10, 10, didn't Jesus promise an abundant life? Didn't he say, I came that you might have life and have life more abundantly? Now, doesn't that promise a happy life here on earth? No, no. The word abundant just means full. And the Apostle Paul had an abundant life. Tribulation, temptation, persecution, stonings, shipwreck, imprisonment, hatred, <laughs> and martyrdom. And uh, that's what we're promised. If yeah. we live God in Christ Jesus, we shall, we shall suffer persecution. You know, um, the whole thing with Nathan is encapsulated in, in, in Nathan. David had committed adultery, he committed murder, and Nathan was called to approve him. I've mentioned this before. And so what did Nathan say to David? God has a wonderful plan for your life. No, he reproved him for his crimes against God. And we're called to be little Nathans because this world has violated the commandments. We commit adultery by lusting. We fornicate, lie and steal and blaspheme. And so we're called to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. If you read what that portion of scripture is, it says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. So it's evangelism. And this is reprove, rebuke with all patience and right. doctrine. So do it with love and patience 
and do it with sound doctrine, not right. traditions of men talking about wonderful plans and changing people's motives for coming to Christ. So, so the promises that really await us are tribulation, persecution, temptations, and sufferings. Here's the thing, though. I've experienced true joy in my life. Mm -hmm. And if for somebody to come along and say, you've never experienced joy, it's ridiculous. I do experience joy as a Christian. What do you say to that? You know, our joy should be an objective joy. Jesus said, rejoice not because demons are subject to you, but rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So that word rejoice contains the word joy. The Y is changed to an I. But that's where our joy comes from. We don't rejoice because things are going cool, because one day you might find yourself in a lion's den, and yeah. lions are going to eat you, and God may not stop their mouths like right. he did with Daniel. And we see people, families eaten by lions. I mean, seriously, you think about that for a minute, uh, standing there with your family and you're going to be eaten by, these are hungry lions, there's a crowd right. roaring with excitement, and what are you going to offer first? Your yeah. arm? <laughs> your head? I mean, the horror is beyond yeah. words, but that's what happened to early Christians, because they live godly in Christ Jesus, not living in America in the 21st century when putting a fish on the back of your car is evangelism. Mm and changing the radio presets to all Christian radio stations. Well, we hit the streets of New York and we asked people the question, what crosses your mind when you hear that God has a wonderful plan for your life? This, these are the results that we heard from the people. Where are you guys from? Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, and you Christians? You yes, love the Lord? we are. We do. Would you ever say to someone, God has a wonderful plan for your life? Yes, definitely. Do you say that? Yes. What would you think of if I said to you, God has a wonderful plan for your life? What would you think of the word wonderful? What does it conjure up in your mind? Joy, Any thoughts? happiness. Would you say that again? Can you hear that? Joy or happiness. A wonderful thing is not to have to work. You know what I'm saying? Have lots of beautiful women like this one right here. Beautiful woman. Beautiful woman. Have, have you know, drive beautiful whips like that. You know what I'm saying? Do, you know what I'm saying? Meet intelligent, beautiful people like you asking me important and inquisitive questions. I just think total peace and bliss and happiness. I think that would be the, you know, to be able to, to, to love unconditionally uh, and eliminate the whole idea of hate. What would God's wonderful plan be? For me to be stay in school, graduate and make this money I'm planning on making. If I prayed and I asked him, I had to get the Ferrari or get that little <laughs> Porsche Carrera, you know. Put it on some uh, 20 inch rims spinning all the way. I would need some, uh, I got some, uh, some jewelry and some world peace. I don't know, I think it would just be that like all my family stays healthy and like we just have a happy next year. And, you know, everything goes good. Yeah, I would say the same thing that all my like wishes would come true, like getting into good college and staying healthy for the next year and all my family being healthy as well. You know what's sad about all those clips is, and, and what's sad about a lot of modern Christianity today is that so often people just think, well, God wants me to be happy, therefore, and then they fill in the blank of whatever they think happiness is, whether it be materialistic things or, you know, whatever it is. Getting back to John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And just that question of, of you know, what does it mean to have an abundant life? Well, what's interesting is the word abundant is used by Paul in, an, in another place in Philippians 4.18. He says, I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied. And the interesting thing about that is he wrote that while he was sitting in prison. He's in jail. Yeah. And people would think, how in the world could he be, you know, happy in jail? Well, I don't think he was totally happy about being in jail, but the point is, he was, he was well taken care of. God was taking care of his every, every need. In Philippians 4.19, it goes on, he says, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So God gives us a good life according to what he thinks goodness is. Right? God's, God has his will done in our life. And sometimes we love it. Sometimes we don't necessarily care for it. You know, like Ray was talking about the people who are martyred for their faith, and we think, well, you know, I, I wouldn't want that to happen. But that's not that's because we're not seeing things from God's perspective, and also we're not think, seeing things in light of eternity. I'm sure every single person who's ever been martyred 
doesn't really care anymore because <laughs> they're in heaven yeah, right. and you know they, they, they've been giving, given great honor because of, because of what they've gone through in the power of God. And so, you know, again, a lot of it just has to do with whose perspective are we thinking about? Are we thinking about life through our perspective and what we want? Or are we looking at the, the perspective of God and what He would have us do? What's wonderful according to Him? Right. So there's, there's a disconnect, a big disconnect with yeah. the message. If we're telling people, come to Christ because He'll make you happy and He'll fulfill your dreams, and they end up coming to church and they see the problems within the church, that there's people with financial hardships, there's people who have all kinds of issues with their kids, a wayward son. Right. And there's some, wait a minute, wonderful plan. Real life. Red, it's not red roses. There's fiery <laughs> trials. There's lion's right. dens. Uh, there's mountaintop experiences. But really, if you want to grow, there's valleys to go through, right? Deep valleys. You know, when I became, became a Christian, I found out what misery was. Seriously, I was uh, enjoying, as Moses, the pleasures of sin for a season before I was a Christian. I became a Christian. Wow. I was like a man who says, I smoke cigarettes. I smoke 40 a day. I got no problem with cigarettes. Well, I'll take them off them and suddenly like that. And when you become a Christian, it means you, you deny yourself. No more pleasures of sin. And suddenly the flesh rises up and wants to sin. The world hates you because of it. So you've got the world, the flesh, and the devil coming against you as a yeah. Christian. And I remember I went through, as a two-week-old Christian, I went through a wilderness experience. Do you know what that is? Yeah, oh yeah. Have you ever been through one? Absolutely. It is horrific. Abs I'd never known misery and depression like it before I was a Christian. But that was my yielding time. And I got to look back and say that wilderness experience was good for me. Jesus went through one, 40 days and was it 40 nights of fasting. Yeah. And it says at the end of that, afterwards, he hungered. What? You know, 40 hours and I'm dying. But yeah, so that's what you promised. You become a Christian, give everything to God. He lets everything come to you uh, so that you'll be purified, so that the scum will come to the top yeah. and you can scrape it off. You know, someone once said, in order for God to mold his children, sometimes he needs to melt them down. And that's precisely what happens in the Christian life. We get melted down and all the dross comes floating to the top. And the truth of the matter is this, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. There may be mountaintops and straight plateaus, but if you want to grow, you're going to experience the valleys. Well, we have a video that we want to show you now. This is dealing with Fox's Book of Martyrs. People say, hey, you know, whatever happened to the disciples and the apostles? How did they die? Well, hold on. Here we go. Philip was crucified. Matthew was beheaded. Barnabas was burned to death. Mark was dragged to death. James, the less, was clubbed to death. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Luke was hanged. And it didn't stop there. Stephen was stoned. Other Christians have been thrown to lions, burned at the stake. And Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us of multitudes that have been killed for the gospel's sake. The Bible says of those who loved God, they were stoned. They were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Hebrews 11.37 According to Christians in Crisis, in the last 2,000 years, an estimated 43 million Christians have been martyred. Over 50% of these were in the last century alone. So welcome to the family. This is what it means to count the cost. We are to count the cost when we become a Christian. You know, Scripture says that brother will rise up against brother. You'll be hated for his namesake. Fathers will try to put you to death. Imagine that. Yeah. Trying to be put to death. Somebody's going to put you to death thinking they're doing God a favor. Mm -hmm. But in all reality, what ends up happening? Well, who, who, who said it, Ray, that uh, uh, the blood of the church... What was it? The blood of the church is the seed of the church, or the blood of the saints is the seed? Yes, it was a well-known man. Well-known man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. Right. There there's really is no way to stifle a Christian. They're only going to be speaking louder and louder. Uh, Eddie, counting the cost. Did you have to count the cost when you became a Christian? You know what? Um, I did, you know, in a bunch, in a bunch of different ways. Um, you know, my friends, I had a lot of friends who just really didn't care for Christians. Uh, certain people in my family really would have liked it if I had not become a 
Christian, so there definitely is, is a cost involved. I think it's important to count the costs in the sense of a lot of times in modern evangelism, the cost basically comes down to you go up front to the front of an altar, you say a prayer in public, and that's it, and you're done. And so a lot of, a lot of people have done that, and as a result, I run into people on the street all the time who they'll say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I, I prayed the sinner's prayer a long time ago. You know, and, and they're, they're basing their eternal salvation on something they did, you know, that took them a few minutes while they were having a religious experience, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. And so there's no fruit in their life. They're sleeping with their girlfriend. They're, they're doing all kinds of things that show that they're definitely, that they could care less about God and what he wants. And yet, you know, they, they, base, they, they base their salvation on something that happened a long time ago. So counting the cost would basically be just be, it would mean understanding the gospel, understanding what it is just clearly from scripture, and then also, you know, knowing what you're getting into. Knowing, for instance, in, a, in an Islamic country right now, if you become a Christian, there's a possibility that you could be ostracized from your family and even killed. That's a cost. Yeah. But the question, the, the bigger question is this. What if you were to gain the whole world you know, the best friends, all the money you could, you could possibly drink, what, dream of. What if you had everything you wanted to and it cost you your eternal soul? Well, I think you pay too much if that's the case, yeah. you know? Why, why in the world would you spend an eternity in hell for, for something as, as lame as money or, you know, whatever else you could prob probably dream of? The, the cost for a soul is invaluable and that's why it's so important to get right with God now, while you're alive, while you still have time. Yeah. You know, some of the first words from God to Saul before he became the Apostle Paul and wrote one third of the New Testament was, hey, you know what, go tell Saul hmm. what great things he must suffer for my namesake. It wasn't right. what great pleasure he's going to experience, but what great things he must suffer. And that really is what happens in the marquee of a Christian, right? Yeah, and if, if you're gonna count the cost, if you, you're not saved and you're counting the cost, don't count too long. Let me see if I can bring the sum down a little bit so that you just have to count up to two. Uh, do a one and underneath it put the pleasures of sin and hell beside it. And number two, repentance and heaven, everlasting life. You shouldn't count too long. Yeah. Uh, there's something in you that says, I don't want to end up in hell, I don't like pain. If you're not sure of that, light a cigarette lighter and put your finger over the flame or go and slam your thumb in a door and see if you like pain. No one likes pain and the Bible says there's a place called hell that is eternal damnation, eternal torment. And I would hate my worst enemy to yeah. end up there. So why should you become a Christian? Because it's the only way you can be saved. Remember yeah. in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Pilgrim or Christian before he was saved just ran out of his house calling out life, life, eternal life. And there's something in you that should be calling that out, that this superficial world cannot grant you. You can enjoy the pleasures of sin, but it's but for a season, and God offers everlasting life to all those who acknowledge the sins and repent. So look at those commandments, examine them under the light of a, a tender conscience, and you'll have a knowledge of sin if you've got a tender conscience, if you look at the commandments, the words of Jesus. Whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. That commandment alone is enough to slay like 99% yeah. of all oh, humanity. Yeah. And all lies of their part in the lake of fire. You need forgiveness. You need a savior. So don't put it off. Don't wait until tomorrow. Hmm. You know, J.C. Ryle said, unless a man be born again, there's going to come a day he wishes he was never born That's true. at all. You know, we... we Please, uh, heed the warning. Uh, Ray, what do you say to someone who says, I'm not a Christian, there are many roads that lead to God, I'm trusting in God's goodness to get me to heaven. God's goodness. You cannot separate God's goodness from His justice. You think of a, a judge in a court of law who turns a blind eye to the workings of the mafia. He sees them raping and murdering and says, oh, who cares, and he just turns the other way. That's a corrupt judge. If the judge is good, he must see that justice is done. If he doesn't see that justice is done, then he's not good and should be prosecuted himself. So if God is good, he will see to it that justice is done. And he's so good, he's going to punish right down to the thoughts and intents of the heart. Right. You know. A lot of people have been murdered in our country, 200,000 people in one 10-year period. Imagine if civil law was removed from America and you could kill anyone you wanted with no retribution or you could rape any woman that you wanted. You would see 
human nature as to how bad it is. That's what God sees. And he says, if you've got the desire, it's as good as the deed. If you say, I could kill that person, God knows if there was no retribution, no justice, you will do it because you've got murder in your heart. And he counts that as murder, that hatred. And same with lust. If you're looking at a woman, you desire her, you knew if she turned to you and says, my husband's away and gave you a wink, you'd be there like grease lightning. God considers the desire the same as the deed because the intent is there. And that's what he's going to hold you and I accountable for if we're not uh, washed by the blood of Christ. You know, crazy enough, last year there was a movie that was released mm. where one day a year people are allowed to go kill, do whatever they want to do. And I, I don't know if it was a blockbuster or not, but I remember that was the premise of the film. I think we have, uh, I wanted to read this quick quote from R.C. Sproul. He said, the equation is simple. If God requires a perfect righteousness and perfect holiness to survive his perfect judgment, then we're left with a serious problem. Either we rest our hope in our own righteousness, which is altogether inadequate, or we flee to another's righteousness, an alien righteousness, a righteousness not our own inherently. The only place such righteousness can be found is in Christ. That is the good news of the gospel. Last question. I think we have time for about 30 seconds more. Ray, I can't share the gospel with my neighbor because he's already happy. They seem to have the perfect family, and finances don't seem to be an issue for them. Well, you have the wrong gospel, because Jesus doesn't promise happiness, he promises righteousness. And whether you're happy or sad, rich or poor, you need the righteousness of Christ. So change yeah. the gospel, it's not a happy message. It is a message of righteousness. Riches profit not on the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. And so if you're not sure what the gospel is, take the time to go to livingwaters.com and listen to Hell's Best Kept Secret. It'll help. Uh, bring a firmer understanding as to what the gospel actually is. Mm. So rich people need the gospel just as much as anybody and everybody else. You know, if somebody's going to be thirsting after righteousness, you know, Jesus said, he who comes to me shall never thirst again. What do they thirst for? They thirst for righteousness, right? He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. Right. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So it's a matter of righteousness, not riches, righteousness, right standing with God the Father. That is what we preach. And we can't move from that picture. Right. So there's many different ways to preach the gospel, whether you do it in the open air, or whether you do it through a pamphlet, but the gospel itself, the message does not change. Right. It was the same 2,000 years ago, and it'll be the same 2,000 years from now. So that is it. We are out of time. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to The Comfort Zone. Look us up on Facebook. Twitter, YouTube, become a subscriber. You will not be disappointed, so I hope. God bless you guys. For questions about the Comfort Zone with Ray Comfort, or to submit questions for future shows, please email us at email at tczlive.com. That's email at tczlive.com. The Comfort Zone is an outreach of living waters. For more resources to inspire and equip you to fulfill the Great Commission, Check out livingwaters.com or call toll free 1 800 437 1893. Now go and preach the gospel. Faith is the great cop out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Richard Dawkins. Imagine visiting some of the world's most prestigious universities, interviewing top evolutionary scientists atheists and holding their feet to the fire until it's clear that there is no evidence for Darwinian evolution, that it's not scientific. So we have thousands of examples. Give me, can you give me one? I can give you, I can give you thousands, just one. To summarize, the observable evidence that you give me for Darwinian evolution is bacteria becoming bacteria. Still bacteria, there's no change of kinds. Evolution versus God. If you believe in evolution, prepare to have your faith shaken. You know, the, the problem with those who are unable to see evolution, I think, is they don't have imaginations. That is so true.